I was writing a book chapter. Um, I was writing about um, the American performance artist uh, Carolee Schneeman, and I was involved, I suppose the object of the research and sort of what was really interesting to me in writing this article was to try to do a bit of, um, I don't know, kind of breaking a bit around uh, the kind of way that Schneeman was at that point sort of understood historically. So I really saw what I was doing as sort of breaking new ground and sort of allowing for um, uh, new understandings around her practice. Um, and uh, I felt really strongly that she, there was, there was scope to do this, scope to understand better about what this artist who had been very strongly associated with maybe one particular work of art, which I'll show you in a second, um, was in fact doing in terms of the way she was collaborating with other artists, the way particularly she was using um, technology in the 1960s and early 1970s, and um, in a sense to sort of bring in her politics or to bring her politics to a larger frame and to sort of try to uh, make a claim for this like what I saw as an incredible ambition for that. So in a way my work in itself was about looking really closely so sort of through intensive sort of forensic archival research and interviewing her um, at what she was doing and then trying to do a kind of corrective with um, what the kind of history books were saying about, about her. So I focused on two main pieces of work in the chapter. It was this is a film she made called Plumline and you can all watch it. It's on a great website called UbuWeb. Um, so she worked on that for three or four years uh, from the late 1960s to early 70s. And the image on the upper left hand side, for example, um, is her. The image on the lower right hand side is um, a, a, a man who she'd broken up with. And the film is sort of about the kind of trauma after that breakup. And things like um, the upper right hand side is, is her hand writing um, the name of the film at the very end of it. Um, the other work I was talking about, or writing about, researching, was um, a big performance that she did at the National Film Theater in 1970. It was part of a big um, film festival, underground film festival, and the piece was called Thames Crawling, and she used many uh, participants, as you can see, lots of naked bodies, um, and big, these inflatables, and um, I, and what was really interesting, it was collaborative, it was with another person. Uh, it was very technological, there were films, there were uh, images um, uh, kind of spread over, projected over the participants. There was this machines on the stage blowing up these big inflatables and then ha all, everything sort of spilled out onto the audience. So there's something about the scope of this and the ambition and the complexity and the sort of inter intermedial aspect of it that I was researching. So what I'm going to do... Um, right now is just to show you a bit of um, the type of material that I was looking at, how I was working as a researcher. So I was looking for anything that I could find regarding a period of time in which Schneeman was living in London. She's American, but she lived in London for three years at the end of the 1960s. So this is her um, editing that film, Plumline, in her um, garden flat in a, in a house in Belsize Park. I found this really interesting, like the fact that she didn't go to what she could have done, which is to go to the London Filmmakers Co-op and work with their equipment. She borrowed equipment, she worked at home, so I was interested in domestic space. This is like a poster from that festival. I um, talked about, and you know, it's a bad image here, but what I could see then was all these other artists actually representing a really interesting international uh, community. Um, this is in the British Art and uh, Arts Film and Video Archive here. This is the, the, I found the program for Thames Crawling, for example, so it, it gave me a sense of her community, what happened in that, um, that was beyond any research that had been published. Um, that's her collaborator, John Lifton. Mm -hmm. This was when they took up residence in, an, in a museum, kind of somewhat illegally. Um, they didn't have money to put themselves up, so they actually built a, um, they put a bed in the space that they were giving to exhibit. Um, this, again, newspaper articles, this is her. Um, this was a poster that got censored from um, the tube stations um, because she was naked. She was uh, naked from the top 
top from the waist up. It's interesting that the artist sitting, st uh, sitting right next to her is um, David Medalla, the um, Philippine artist, and he was naked too, but that didn't cause the offense. Um, I visited her many times, and for example, that's her and John Lifton, a kind of ID card. This was in one of her scrapbooks, and it was an ID card for the, the first Euro, Euro, European sex paper, Suck, presents the Wet Dream Festival. Um, I think that was in Amsterdam. Um, and then things like I was visiting her, this is in upstate New York, and um, trying to make sense of just her, her, uh, her archives. And um, these are notebooks relating to how she thought about things. So that's her handwriting. Some of it has to do with being under understand somebody else's handwriting. And this was a thing I thought was really interesting because it sort of spoke to how she came up with ideas. So this says, sitting in the alien registration police office, and it either says dying or trying to have something for this performance. And it maybe says victims or maybe it says something else. So she, um, the article was also about exile because she um, certainly experienced being a foreigner in the UK in the early 1970s. Um, uh, more examples of the research. And this was something that had been recently written about. And then, of course, there was her. Um, so this is sort of apropos of um, the, um, the kind of story that I'm about to tell. So I suppose what I'm trying to say, um, I did this research over a long period of time. And maybe it matters that I did it at a time I was finished with my PhD. I wasn't full-time employed by the um, university. Um, so in a sense, it was sort of semi-independent. A lot of it was speculative. I went, I, I reached out to her um, on a whim, uh, not on a whim, but on a kind of, um, what do you call it, a sort of, a hunch, a hunch. Um, and this, what grew out of that in a very organic and seemingly natural way was a series of visits to her to talk about these works and to kind of try to consolidate some knowledge around um, this period of time that she spent in London. And I felt a certain personal resonance with that for obvious reasons. So I went to visit her in this house in upstate New York. Um, and for a period of time, I went twice a year, and I would spend a day or two um, interviewing her and then visiting her archive and taking notes and taking pictures and so on. OK, so what I wanted to do here is to tell you where that got to. And this is just an episode. But um, so I'm writing this book chapter, um, and I uh, sent it to her. Um, and she objected. To something in it. Um, and so I'm just going to read out what I wrote and then tell you what she objected to. So I wrote um, towards the, the very beginning of the, the chapter. I said, what many have in their minds when they think of Schneemann is interior scroll, which she performed in East Hampton, Long Island in 1975 and at the Telluride Film Festival in Colorado, 1977, and which is represented in a number of public collections, Tate Gallery, um, as text and image photo collages. Or maybe it's Schneemann as Manet's Olympia in Robert Morris's 1964 performance and film Sight. Sight is now considered a work that importantly positions Morris between sculpture and performance, but the potential for Schneemann's role did not play out as successfully as his did. So just to, for points of reference, that's maybe the most iconic image of interior scroll. Um, it's the one where she pulls a long piece of paper out of her vagina and reads it. Um, and it's a kind of rant against uh, the sense that the, the discourse around filmmaking in the 1960s was dominated by men. Um, and this is an image, one image from the performance that I refer to called Sight. And that is, so that's Schneemann. And maybe you, I have another image of Manny's Olympia that will hope, hopefully consolidate that reference. So she sits on this sofa for the length of that performance while Robert Morris, um, with a mask on, sort of moves these huge um, things around her. It's a sort of performance of a sculpture. So this is what she wrote back. She said, my position with Bob Morris's site was never presumed to be collaborative. That's interesting. In this case, I had the pleasure, the adventure, of being placed within his determinate imagery. At the time, there was no issue of feminist definition. I entered his historic 
reconfiguration with great admiration for the work and pleased to be placed within it. There is no way in which I initiated my role, but I was quite thrilled to inhabit his vision and its historic richness. It is extremely distressing to project a revisionist criticism in terms of absent feminist principles. Early feminist self-definitions were definitely part of the Judson Dance Group, which she was associated with, but at this early junction, we were not exclusively expecting a feminist certainty. To judge my participation in sight as lacking my own motives is to completely deform the clarity and rigor of Morris's conception. Um, okay, so what do you do? That's quite an intelligent response, isn't it? Um, and uh, challenging on many levels. Um, what would you do? Richard. I don't know what I'd do, but what that interchange highlights to me, coming from a literature background, is the intentional fallacy. Yeah. But your role as a critic, and you have to make a decision whether you are going to go with even the author's perspective the creator's perception yep. of the intentional fallacy. Her intentions then or now are actually not the stuff of the critic's discourse. Yep. Yep. So you have to make that decision. <laughs> And I think that's, yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think that's, I wouldn't, I would not give up that, say, that belief that um, is it up to her to tell, to, 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 to determine the way um, this could be interpreted. Can I say something? In a way, what's interesting that, about this and something I want to say is actually, this didn't even matter. <laughs> this was like, this was like one of those things in a piece of writing where you're just trying to set up a situation. So. It was interesting, actually, of all the thing, of the whole article, this is the only thing that she objected to. And for me, in writing it, it was like one of those just interpolations of something, right? Just a desire to sort of set up a certain situation. Um, and so to, to kind of extend a dialogue around this actually would have been to divert from the thing I really wanted to say. It was interesting. So I think she handed me the right to rewrite it. I rewrote it and I sent that back to her. I think one thing that was issue, and maybe it speaks to the question of um, our relationship, is that um, there's an issue of feminism there and who's feminism. And I think there's no question, and it is absolutely unresolvable, the fact that her feminism will be different from my feminism. Um, and so maybe I do find it problematic that she was disavowing a kind of feminist position in having done that. I do find that problematic and that she didn't want to be engaged in that. Whereas in other regards, she's overtly a feminist and that was what my article was mainly trying to, um, to draw out. Um, and so one can't change the fact that she and I are different. We're from different generations, we're from different practice points of view, and that, um, and I'm trying to report and write something as a historian where she's, she's the practitioner um, I think the, the question is about representation and responsibility as well. So it matters deeply um, that uh, I think the question of representation obviously is a shared responsibility in this case, but um, it was complicated by the fact that the, that the entire work of the essay was to try to represent something uh, more fully and more uh, fulsomely about her practice, which arguably was something that has been historically marginalized and certainly sort of misunderstood um, and kind of calcified around sort of a certain era of, um, of discourse. So this was my whole, that was my whole job. That was what I thought my whole job was as, as a researcher. This question of relationships is, is important too. And of course there is in any relationship a quid pro quo. And um, if she, we were talking about that earlier, if she, for example, at that point had said no, what would I have done? Would I have been able to publish, for example? Um, I know of other examples where it comes down to um, images. So the uh, part of our uh, system inscribes academic freedom, the ability to write something, whatever you want, as long as it's not defamatory. And so I probably would have been able to publish the chapter, but, sh but I was dependent on her for the permissions to use her images in order to, to, to uh, illustrate it. And so if she hadn't given to me, that would have been a kind of um, 
demonstration of the fact that that relationship had broken down. So I think what I just want to end on is that this idea that these are, um, for me, the issue was about this moment of publication. So this, this um, moment in which I was switching gears from being a researcher, like investigating, exploring, communicating in those terms, towards this moment when I was going to publish something. And that is a really important hinge. Um, and of course, now I'm in control of the representation in that. Um, and of course, once you publish something, it goes out into the world, and it stands there, and it travels, and it's, it's the thing. Um, it sets it down. Um, I, think, I think this question of um, there being ongoing work, and maybe these are all just sort of temporary resolutions for it, matter. And in a way, just to flag up, I consider this a form of, of uh, communication about this issue that needs care and contextualization and so on and so forth. In a way, I'm representing this thing, which in a way is a private conversation between her and me here today.